Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day, how's it going? What do you know, Strike Light? Clayton here from XY Advisor. Um, just chatting with Steve today in the glorious, uh, as you just mentioned, most professional podcast studio you've ever been a part sure of. Sure is. Going to claim that. Obviously, Fraser Jack would disagree. All right, ETF watch. The thing that I found really interesting about uh, our conversation that we had via the um, via the XY platform was... Um, a lot of people talk about they understand investments, but then very few people actually build a fully resourced website <laughs> to get to like show the world how much they know. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like I, I dug it, man. So like ETF Watch, when did it start? Why did it start? Um, yeah, talk to me about it. Yeah, so um, started it in uh, end of 2015. Okay, um, so about four years ago. Uh, and it just sort of started, like at the time, ETFs were, was starting to really get popular. Yeah, and yeah. And starting to sort of hit the mainstream a little bit more. But the information out there in Australia about what was available um, was just pretty limited. And, and literally, I, it was probably early 2015 where I was like, oh, it's try, time to sort of understand a bit more about ETFs. Mm. Um, and I went to try to find a list of ETFs out there and it was literally going to the ASX website and downloading a PDF. Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't do much with a PDF. Um, <laughs> and, and once that volume of ETFs got to a point where there was quite a few out there and you want to go search for certain specialities and that sort of thing, mm. it, just be, it was really hard to do that. And um, saw in the US and UK... There, where the market's more more mature, there were a lot of sites doing this. And so I thought, well, there's an opportunity here to kind of be the Australian ETF um, site. And so launched the site with a sort of fund screener, which allows you to go and sort of filter and find um, funds that meet your needs. And then launched a blog and uh, mailing list with it. And it's just kind of gone from there and sort of grown every year and it's pretty cool um, so yeah. are you the one doing the research or do you have other people doing the research uh look i wouldn't call us a research site we're not sure. trying to compete with a research house yes um so we're more just well, providing a research like blogs are you yeah the one? yeah, you're yeah. The, you're so the... i'm writing the writing the content pretty yeah. much get the odd guest um poster mm. um but yeah I'll, I'll, i'm kind of keeping up with what's going on new funds being listed or new trends emerging um, and just keep the, the content going on that. You try to write a couple of blogs a, a month. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's always new funds being listed and stuff. So there's plenty to write about. So you've got obviously iShares that are owned by BlackRock and Vanguard, who are pretty much the biggest two players in the market. Yeah. Are they constantly launching new ETFs or is it smaller players that are entering the market? Um, they are. They're, Probably beta shares over the last few years has been the, the most prominent. Um, yeah. Like ETF, like they've launched a lot of ETFs. They've got over 50 now, I think. How do you, yeah. how good's the, um, the bear, that strong bear one where it doubles? Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, not real good over the last year or so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I always thought, and tell me if I'm wrong, so you might understand. So when volatility goes up, the VIX index goes up, obviously. And then the price of, a put option goes up. So, so it, it's expensive to make money from the idea that the market's going to go down. But I feel like with that strong bear, rather than going out and uh, betting against the market, you could always purchase this strong bear and get double whatever, you know, like it's a really simple algorithm. Yeah. Like, but I, I always think to myself, Rather than get way too deep in into it and and be purchasing options, 
if you think the market's going to go down, then just go on to Comsec or whatever, purchase uh, your your strong bear, and then hold it for as long as you want. And you you're not paying for any of the increased uh, volatility. Yeah, th- and that's one of the advantages of ETFs, right? There's yeah. like all these different sectors and different uh, themes and trends you can invest in. Yeah. Through just a share trade, you know, and like yeah. you say, you can do that without the the leverage and the risk of options or CFDs or any of those sorts of things. Mm. You know, obviously, you're still carrying a lot of risk by doubling down <laughs> on markets falling. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, without and all that complexity that comes with those sort of other Man, other instruments. Yeah, totally. I always yeah. try to find an easy way to do something. I remember finding out about really getting into shares when I was a tax accountant, sort of like the mid. 2000, so just before uh, the GFC. And um, it was kind of interesting. What I used to do was I figured out that the specy stocks, right, they would move on uh, news in the market. So rather than I was certainly no uh, technical analysis investor, I wasn't even <laughs> fundamental. I was, what's the news <laughs> and can I front run the news? Um, which, you know, to my <laughs> is actually how... Uh, the bots that trade most of the market these days, to be fair. Um, but so back in the day, there was this little specky sheet and I subscribed to it. But then I noticed that uh, as soon as the, the, the specky sheet was sent out to the mailing list, right, that these little shares would go up 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 percent in the space of a couple of minutes. Yeah, right. And I also noticed that the, um, the URL where each monthly specy sheet, the PDF, good old PDFs, was hosted, right? So you'd have to wait on the email. Whoever got to the email first would then click on the link to go to the PDF. And the PDF was hosted on a very predictable URL. Ah. So <laughs> what I did was, is I was like, okay, cool. So I can tell where, what the URL for next month is going to be. And so I would stick a um, like an alert function on the this URL that didn't exist, yeah, and and it would tell me as the moment that the PDF was uploaded, and it was uploaded like you know a half an hour before the email was sent out. So I would get this alert and be like, boom, there's the research. Go in and purchase, uh, you know, like man, a thousand dollars, right? Like I yeah. didn't have much money, uh, and I would purchase a thousand dollars, and then the rest of the share would come on. It would spike a couple of hundred percent, and I'd sell. And I, I thought I was a genius. I was like, I'm definitely the smartest guy that's ever existed, and I'll never have to work again. <laughs> but then, like two months in. Uh, the guy goes, oh, yeah, so we figured out that someone's <laughs> reading the report before it goes out, so we're going to have to, you know, make the URL uh, variable, and uh, I was never yeah, able to do it again. That's the problem with those schemes. They always work until they don't, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I learned my lesson there. So, um, funnily enough, they actually put up a, a uh, like, a pretend one. I, like, oh, really? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. So, they got me. So, I ended up purchasing a bunch of shares. I lost pretty much all the money that I'd made. <laughs> like, they were kind of cheeky. But I was being cheeky, so it all worked out for yeah. in the end. Um, man, like, so, love a good share trade. Got into uh, ETFs after that because I was like, I'm way too emotionally attached to, uh, to, to you know, shares. And I never um, I never purchased another share after that little jaunt. Um ETFs, on the other hand, do a lot of the work for you and there's passive and there's active. What do you tend to think in terms of, are there any, into your mind, are there any active trading algorithms that you're impressed even exist in an ETF? Most of the active ones are more, it's more the, it's still the human, like a traditional managed fund where you've got a fund manager who's trying to use their skills to outperform and they might have their own tools to do that to do some quant quant stuff in the background but um but they're kind of not giving that ip away Mm. um some of the more interesting ones is that middle ground which the the industry calls smart beta which is the not active and not passive but kind of in the middle where they're still rules based but they the still rules based like a passive etf or as Passive ETFs just following the market cap weighted index. Yes. But the indexes that the smart beta um, follow is more, is, has been developed using some sort of other methodology. And there's some quite interesting ones there that, um, that show that there are ways that, you know, 
to outperform the market by just using an alternate methodology. Do you do, um, do you seriously think that you can you can outperform the market using a simple methodology? Yeah, well, like like a simple one like um, equal weighting your allocation. So a standard market cap index, you know, you if you invest in the ASX two hundred, you've got ten percent of your portfolios in C, um, CBA. I think they're the biggest at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas you know, by equal weighting, you're not getting that kind of exposure to just a few companies you're equal weighting across the whole market yeah and it's proven over long time periods to provide better performance Um, and it makes sense i mean if you if you're investing in if you're investing one percent of your okay let's not call it one percent of the wealth but one percent of the allocation to say australian you know equities uh and one percent of that allocation is in number 200 sized company in australia like that's still a pretty good investment but you've got a long you've got a huge uptick for growth potential yeah that's right yeah Yeah. and so totally that makes sense because passive was the the term passive was just given to market weighted top 200 but it's technically that's no more passive than no it's still active right yeah exactly (laughs) Exactly. that's really interesting i remember someone explaining it to me once i was like it is god that was great marketing to call that passive um but equal weighted for that same um exposure rather than market weighted would be technically as passive yeah there's no reason why it's not it's just that the the market weight indexes are the 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 indexes that everyone kind of follows so that's kind of deemed to be what's passive okay so it basically just reflects the the ups and downs of the market probably just with more intensity more volatility so it's up further when it's up and down further when it's down but i guess technically if we expect the market to go up over the long term then well you're going to end up ahead yeah yeah and you're getting the like you say you're getting one percent in the 200th largest company which yeah probably has more growth potential than the the largest company right yeah so you're, you're getting more act access to the the companies coming up yeah up the ranks yeah that's cool man so how much time do you have to put into running this website uh not a lot um (laughs) it looks cool did you design it are you like a hacker i like i've done a bit of ux yeah um, looks good so i i can kind of hack together a screen design but i can't code okay um so i've done i've done that and then sort of handed off to some developers to to develop a site. Um, so, what do you do? Design it in like Photoshop or something like that? Yeah, there's like yeah, there's right. there's other tools that are laid to do sort of simple kind of design work. Cool. Um, so, I've, yeah, I've done a, a bit of that through my career. So that's not too um, that comes kind of naturally to me. Yeah. Um, but it's not my full time kind of job. So it's only a bit of a, a side hustle. Yeah. Um, which is why you only see a couple of blog posts a month because it's, you know, it <laughs> takes a lot of time to write content. Oh, um, man. So long. And so I, yeah. And so I kind of, you know, spend as much time as I can. It's probably a few hours a week on it. Um, but, but it's definitely not a full time gig for me. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Well, I mean, XY was a, a hobby side gig for six years until it wasn't so there you go yeah that's right um now for the listeners out there you were a power planner for a while and you became an advisor for like six months yeah very brief period i sort of i started as a um as a grad um with uh cba in their financial planning division and sort of spent that next 15 years um basically in that financial advice space but not as an advisor. I did, yeah, at the end of the grad program, I did a very short stint as yeah. an advisor and then decided that wasn't really for me and then got more into the, um, you know, started in the power planning and, and eventually ran a power planning team and then moved more into the kind of um, licensee services kind of space. A lot of project work, rolling out FOFAR and um, a lot of sort of um, growth innovation sort of work. What does growth innovation work mean? Oh, you know, trying to spend a lot of the last few years um, at BT actually working as a product manager there for the advice business. So trying to, you know, provide a better client, better client outcomes, um, more like digitizing processes, mm. um, just try to provide a better client experience and advisor experience throughout what is, a, you know, tends to be a pretty clunky kind of 
process. Insanely clunky. Yeah. 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 So that was a um, that was a challenge, especially in a um, in a large corporate. You got a lot of technology issues, like you know, huge. You know, if you want to change a, a field in a in one of your <laughs> applications, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's. <laughs> Jesus. Um, so like, I think there's smaller end of towns definitely, um, probably got an advantage there because it's, it is difficult to innovate in those large organizations. That's for sure. Yeah. I think it's because obviously they're designed to earn, uh, revenue and they're very well designed to earn revenue. And so from their point of view, you know, especially these huge product manufacturers, big four, um, their, their, their goal is to make billions of dollars. And so ultimately, um, ha- they've got to compete with their commercial outcomes with the government's regulatory outcomes. And that's, that's a, that's a very difficult job to do. And companies that I guess don't have such difficult waters to navigate can handle those changes a lot easier. Um, and for many, many, many years, the, the big four were able to do quite well out of it. But now, uh, you know, BT, for example, um, and a few of the other products, they're escaping advice at yeah. this stage. Yeah. yeah, because it's just got, um, like you say, a, like the, a big company to comply with the the legislation and having ASIC um, keeping a really close eye on them. It's just um, it's just got too expensive to do business for them. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just you know where where you know in the early two thousands they all got into vertical integration and went. This is a um, great way to make money um you know as that regulation hit that really was designed to break up vertical integration it just all got it all got too hard i think yeah yeah um it's super interesting in terms of watching i mean if anyone could make financial services a profitable massive scale company it was the big four banks and they couldn't yeah and then you've got you know the most successful Entrepreneur, well, one of the handful of the most successful entrepreneurs in financial services in this company, Boris, with uh, Yellow Brick Road, yeah. wasn't able to do it. Yeah. And uh, whenever I look at anyone who's trying to do something massively scalable, that no one is able to do it. But if you look at um, companies that just sort of focus on delivering a great outcome for advisors and don't try and twist their arm into anything. I mean, the biggest growing, say, platforms at the market, you have 24 is in NetWells, right? Yeah. Oh, there's BT Panorama, but in a lot of ways, that's just because it inflows from the old BT yeah, product. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, so scoping that out, you got NetWells and Hub24, and they're, they're not aligned to any dealer group, and they're doing really well in this yeah. new market. Um, so it tells me definitely stay in your lane Offer and, and, and don't blur the lines between product and advice. And the moment that you separate product and advice, advice has a chance to flourish. ASIC gets out of the way. Um, and, and there's this whole, I guess, issue in financial planning, which has been the result of, uh, you know, profit at huge scales, kind of creating a lower quality outcome for both the advisor and the client and there's this really sort of weird interrelationship between product and advice but that is finally i can see getting ripped apart Uh, and and unfortunately advisors are now the ones that have to suffer the consequences of all of that but hopefully at the end of it we're actually going to see what i see is the most valuable profession around which is financial planning finally being able to excel so maybe I'm being optimistic. No, but I that's agree. How I, see I think it. it's a, um, I think it's still a long time away, particularly because it's going to take a, a real change at um, the government and, and the regulator to sort of to see these green shoots and then yeah. relax their um, what they're expecting, because um, they're always looking for the the one percent of people doing the wrong thing, and to, and whilst ever that one percent is still around, it's very difficult for them to unwind it's a really the legislations point. that have been put in place so it's definitely on the path but i think it's i still think it's going to take a long time but i think anyone who just hangs in there hopefully we'll, we'll start seeing you know eventually a um an environment that's simpler to operate in yeah i think uh, the, the more i look at what asic have been doing i actually tend to think that they're they've got 
I think they do understand that advisors aren't the problem. It's just that the advisors have operated in a problematic environment. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, as you just said, I'm really excited to see the regulatory environment start seeing better outcomes for clients and less conflicts moving forward and hopefully at some stage relax a little. Yeah. Um, as a part of that though, occasionally things get through the cracks such as the commissions paid on uh, IPOs or LSEs. Yeah, it's been an interesting one lately. What? I didn't even know that existed. What's up with that? Yeah, so so as part of ETF Watch, um, we also cover uh, listed investment companies. And the reason why when I launched ETF Watch was I was like, is this ETFs only or is this ETFs and leaks? And the reason why I kept it as both was because there's more and more active ETFs that are essentially investing the exact same way as the leaks. Some of them are even the exact same strategy offered as a leak and an ETF. And it's really just the tax structure that's different. And so it's like, well, if you're a self-directed investor looking at investing in a fund that you can trade on the ASX, well, you should, you should open your mind to ETFs and leaks. So I, so I included leaks. Um, and for, and, and the history there is, um, uh, obviously as part of FOFA, commissions were banned on, on, uh, managed funds. But there was an exemption granted to um, companies um, raising capital in IPOs. And the, the argument at the time was, um, well, companies raising capital in IPOs are, it's an essential part of a, a, a thriving economy. Yes. And, you know, if you're a, if, if you're a, not an investing company, but a trading company and you need to raise money in an IPO, well, that money goes back into the economy and it's ultimately a good thing for the, the economy as a whole. Um, but listing ca- investment companies were included in that. And that's a weird one. <laughs> and it means that, um, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It means that essentially a fund manager can go and round up a bunch of brokers and, um, come up with a, with a investment that they want to raise capital for. And the, the brokers can then go and, um, you know, the bro- brokers are then remunerated by how much money they raise and the, the commissions are usually around the, one to three percent. That's insane. Yeah, um, and you and what we've seen is probably since 2014 a booming leak IPO environment. <laughs> um, I wonder that why. That probably came to a head like in 2018. I think there were about 15 leak IPOs, and they rate and there were these fund managers that um, were very un- unknown. <laughs> they had like small little funds, and yeah. then they went and did a leak IPO and raised a billion dollars. <laughs> um, and you know, and then they got in at that time where like they just had you know two years of good performance, so the you know the brokers could be going, oh, well, these guys have done twenty percent for the last two years straight. Um, and 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 that's where we're at now. And it's at last year, um, late last year, it sort of got on ASIC's radar, and there was a few media commentators that started going, hey, this isn't really right. Um, good on them. Yeah. Do you, who, do you know who they were? Shout out. To them. Um, Chris Joy, well the AFR, like he's a fund manager and an AFR commentator. He's been very vocal about it. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just come to a head um, now where uh, Josh Frydenberg just announced a four-week consultation into it. Yes. And so we'll expect probably, probably, I don't know if it'll be a budget thing that they'll launch in the budget or like, you know, at least probably before the next financial year, there'll be some new rules around it. But it's really important one for financial advisors because, you know, financial advisors have been the whipping boys of poor conduct for a long time now. Absolutely. And the and a lot of the media is saying financial advisors are selling these lick IPOs, which, you know, there's probably a handful of financial advisors are. It's all it's brokers who are doing it. Absolutely. Um. So, like, you know, it's an important one for financial advisors to get involved in the conversation though and go, no, we. We're, we're we're not conflicted anymore. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be associated with this, yeah. and therefore, getting rid of it is the right thing to do. Um, 100%. In 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 total, and so it's um it's going to be interesting to see what comes of it. There's a bit of um back and forth on both sides of the debate in the media at the moment, which has been interesting to read. I haven't followed. There's what, a bit what, of a slugfest of a couple of um commentators on each side of the debate and so getting who, quite personal. Who's, de- who's defending it and what's the argument for the defence? <clears throat> There's a couple of associations that are kind of 
vested in it that are defending it. So there's an association of, oh, the of sto- leaks the, and the, the Stockbrokers stock Association. Association, <laughs> I'd imagine it'd be um, all over so it. So then they've kind of they've got um, some people that they've kind of recruited that are sort of well known in the media to sort of help them with their kind of case. Now, when you say recruited, do you mean paid? I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I guess, I guess we can yeah. speculate, yeah. but we can neither confirm nor deny. No. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, and the arguments for, they're pretty weak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll um, scope one argument off the table. We like money. So, yeah. let's go that out. What, what is the well, defense? Like, the, the arguments for is, well, if these, like, a lot of the argument is if these things are going to launch, then people need an incentive to, to, they to don't offer need them. to launch, though. There's so and many it's like, well, yeah, and it's like, existing. No, and the, the counter argument to that is, well, like, Magellan just launched a new leak late in 2019, offering no broker commission, but offering bonus shares for people who participated in the IPO. So it's in it's in it's in the fund manager's interest to raise money in a leak of because course. then they have this locked in capital, right? Because that's that's the big advantage of a leak. Once you've raised that money, you've got a management fee there into perpetuity. Yes. Um but to make it in the investor's interest, Magellan went, well, if you participate in this IPO, we'll give you like one bonus share for every 10 you invest in. Oh, I can't remember what it was, but sure. something along those lines. So then it's the investor's going, well, I get $11 of value for $10. Um, yeah, like makes makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, then kind of everyone wins. Yes. So, yeah, the and it was easy for Magellan at being a large household name. But if you're a smaller fund manager who doesn't have that kind of reputation, then it's probably harder to raise the sort of money that they did. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the arguments for are around just around that. Mm. Um, they're also proposing just putting caps on the commission like capping it at one to two percent oh which um i don't know i guess it's a step in the right direction but uh, but yeah they're like they're the arguments aren't <laughs> they're not great strong, yeah. yeah they're not great yeah. um i actually i don't mind um getting you know I, I certainly don't mind people getting paid to help launch a company from private to to public i think that that is that's a that's a difficult journey, and I think there does need to be levels of locked in money to give security to the company that's launching from private to public. Yep. Um, but but an LIC, I mean, they're not creating any new value or any new asset. They're just consolidating, you know, yeah, a, they're a just chunk, buying existing assets. a chunk of the market, yeah. and so there's no there's no additional value added to the economy there. So. Um, yeah, I can't imagine why um, there. I, I, I'd love to. I'd love to hear. You know, the person. I, I might actually go check. So, who did you say was giving the defence in the in the media? Um, it's Dominic McCormack. He's okay. on Livewire, so it's all, most of his oh, stuff's on Livewire. Okay. Right, yeah. right, right. Interesting. Um, but it, I think there's, and I wrote a piece, and I did a submission to the um, consultation the other day, and. Um, the, like for me, I think the answer is the active ETF is the answer to this lick miss selling issue because well, yeah, of course. I think at the end of the day, and this is why ETFs have, have just got so popular, is you know like investors were never drawn to managed funds because it's so damn hard to buy and sell a managed fund. Oh, especially if off market. Yeah, Definitely. like if you're if you don't have access to a platform like an advisor does, yeah. and you've got to go and fill in a paper form oh dude you've got to give you 100 points of id yeah <laughs> um you've got to like do a if like a direct deposit yeah it's horrible. and then when you want to redeem your funds you've got to fill in another form you've got to wait a week it's so um, bad and so why etfs got so popular is it's like oh i just go into my brokerage account and i just yeah place a trade yeah um and that's one of the pills of licks as well you can just go in and you can buy a magellan lick or a platinum lick or, yeah. or, or whatever but Active ETFs are doing essentially the same thing, um, you know, and there's some things that there's some features of leaks that um, some people say are positive, some could argue they're a negative. For example, they can trade at a premium or a discount to their, yeah. their underlying net asset value. Yeah. Now, if you're an astute investor and you're finding leaks that are trading at a discount and writing them to a premium, you can make money out of that. But if you're a retail in- investor that just wants to buy, a lick because you like that manager, um, 
then you might be buying at a premium and then you and then you make a loss when it goes to a discount so you know there's positives and negatives to that the other thing is the um the dividends you know licks because they're a company they're paying the tax and they can pay fully frank dividends and they can also control their distributions more than a managed fund because they can retain earnings um and that's one of the other arguments for the licks um but in an active etf well, all that's happening is that tax liability is moving from the company to the individual. The individual is probably able to get um, capital gains tax discounts that the company can't. And then and, and then it's on the active ETF manager to then um, manage their buy and sell decisions in a in a way that um, will that won't have huge skews in distributions. And I think that's one thing the managed funds industry is been uh, poor out over the years is focusing more on headline performance rather than those buy and sell trades that that a might realize tax and then create these huge lumpy distributions mm. um so i think an active etf if they they manage all that that's the sort of solution um oh definitely yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, what well, there's a few things that's that are holding active etfs back a little bit at the moment one's um asics asic um put a pause on new active etfs launching last year for six months while they reviewed it and one of their big concerns is the buy sell spreads or the bid ask spreads of mm-hmm. the active etf um and there was some there's some managers out there who are putting these huge spreads in because it basically it, an active etf has a well all etfs have a market maker that creates the market for them yes and an active etf um, a lot of fund managers do that internally to protect their ip Yes, and these fund managers could then put a huge bid ask spread on, and that's a new, that's another revenue source for them. Stop it! Essentially, um, a commission. Essentially, it's a fee without looking yeah. like a fee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you've got a one, if it costs you one percent each way, on the way in and the way out in a um, buy sell spread, then yeah, that's a nice little fee for them. So, yeah. ASIC put a hold on it, and um, they've reopened it again, but said it's kind of under. You know, we're watching it. Um, but I think they need to probably be more prescriptive about what those bid ask spreads put caps on them, or you know, get really go to town on the on the guys who are who are who are milking it. Um, and the other thing that's holding it back a bit is the ASX listing fees. Um, it's incredibly expensive to launch a active ETF on the ASX, like reportedly a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, um, just to keep it running. And so, if you're a small fund manager. Um, you know, until we get a huge, like quite a lot in there, it's it's sort of uncommercial. So mm. it would be nice if the ASX kind of supported the segment a little bit more. I think the ASX has, um, they've pushed their M funds product for a long time. What did you which, think of that? Well, I thought it was, it was a good solution. It wasn't a bad idea. Yeah. The brokers, most of the retail brokers didn't get on board, which was <laughs> like. That's because <laughs> there was no way to get paid. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's like, it clearly hasn't been a success. I think they've got a billion dollars in there now Ooh, yeah, and right. it's taken what five, five, six, five years? six years. Yeah. And, you know, in the meantime, the ETF industry has grown to 60 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I think it might be time for them to put that to bed and go, oh, we need to better support this active ETF world. Yeah, you know? no, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I used to use, uh, M funds for my SMSF clients. I didn't have many of them, but, uh, looking across the universe of, options i was like well if you want access to all of this stuff and this was going back about five six years yeah. when m funds were brand new i was like oh right yeah so asx are launching these things you can access all of this without paying paying platform fees and um yeah in the end just never took off no nah, and that's still you still have the same issues some of the same issues with a managed fund where you can't buy and sell in real time like i think it's end of day yeah. settlements and things like that yeah, so yeah the active etf probably still like a better option no it's a really good point so active etf looks to be um the solution there's just a couple of things that asic uh, are watching um frydenberg putting this uh consultation together with the month of feedback um some of the stuff was great in terms of what we've spoken about in removing uh commissions from lic's um some of the stuff, I don't know if you looked at how it's impacted financial advice at all. There was a couple of other things included in, in the submission, if that's what you call it, um, which was uh, limiting um, financial advice fees being received from my super products. 
Now, my super products make up uh, a large portion of the industry at this stage. Um, and when they were launched, you you could take, I think it was like seven different fees out of it. You know, there's an yeah. admin fee, there's an investment fee, there was a um, insurance fee, an advisor fee was one of them, there was a couple other little ones. And now they're saying you're not allowed to, which is not... It, it's not removing all the options, like as far as I can tell, like I don't know everything about it, but it looks like you can still receive um, advice fees from non my super yeah. products. Um, but the problem is going to be um, advisors have gone through so much recently that tackling this new thing is going to be a big problem. So, the whole industry was given, you know, we had FOFA 2013, right? And then between 2013 and 2019, people had to get used to the idea of the new world. Yeah. And then 2019 to 2024, I believe, which is um, you need to have a degree. So there's there's a, <laughs> you've got a fair few years to sort of catch up to the new standard yeah. as well. This one's like, hey, man, we're giving you a month. Yeah. <laughs> that's a month a month a month is too short so um no one's and in and obviously in a mixed with all of these other big topics that are going on concurrently right yep. so it so um yeah i'm not i'm not sure if you've followed this because obviously um this is very financial advice focused but it is largely unreasonable to my mind, I think to anyone's mind, because if you would consider the average advisor probably earns ninety percent of their fees from ninety uh, percent of their ongoing fees from um, from superannuation of their clients, and the reason for that is well, it's deductible, like it's tax deductible yeah. to the fund, and it doesn't hurt cash flow. And so, if you are adding more value, which Assumably, you are adding more value than the value that you're receiving from the client. Then they're they're ahead. Uh, if we remove superannuation being an op- an option to receive fees for advisors, I think we're going to have a let's say if it was just this, so there was no other new requirements. The financial advice had just been sitting around chilling out for the last ten years, and this was the only thing. Yeah. It could get done if you gave it, again, the, the sort of the five to six year mark. Is it really? They've only given it a month. Well, that that's right. So, so uh, this consultation. Oh, the consultation on the licks though is, um, that's a separate consultation. Oh, right, right, right. So that, that the one you're talking about is the royal commission proposals, right? Yes, but there's still a month of consultation. No, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. and so and so people will have a month to decide if this is a if this is an, a thing that's going to go forward or not. Now, obviously, I don't imagine it's going to be enacted day one. Yeah. But, um, but while everything else is going on concurrently, my God, like advisors have got so many balls just no, yeah, like, it's, like it's getting paid like at them. for 10 years now, right? I know, but it's, I swear <laughs> to God, it's ramping up. Like yeah. it's, it's impossible. Um, I've spoken with a handful of advisors. I've done media interviews. I've spoken to the head of associations like in the last week because and this I can tell you is going to have a bigger effect on advice than all of the other stuff combined because the, the other stuff's annoying but it was given enough time and it wasn't 95 90 to 95% of the revenue yeah like this is a huge yeah, it's, huge thing yeah it's it's a hard. That's a hard one. This the fees in super because I can see. I get the point of what they're trying to achieve here. Same, me too. But you know, like most people, don't have the cash flow in their pocket to be paying the advice fees that are high because there's so much compliance. Totally. Um, yeah. So you know, you want more people to get good advice, um, but you 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 know you clearly don't want them to get ripped off. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the happy medium is there. Yeah, I, I would suggest um, not not putting this on the table until the um, the education standards are finished. That that would be, I'm like, okay, can we just hold off yeah. till 2024 um, and then talk about it then? Yeah. Um, that would be that. I would like to see that happen because the we had like in the industry, it was reported that 16 advisors killed mm-hmm. themselves last year. 
big deal. Absolutely. Um, and uh, this is going to, I don't want to say it, but I feel like it might replicate it. That, yeah. Which at its worst, right? And, yeah. and that's 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 now yeah. terminal. Unfortunately, the you know the government wants to be seen to be ma- taking action, right, out of the royal commission. Yeah, but they already have. Yeah, they they literally already have. Yeah. Like you've achieved there's huge changes. Yeah. Um, can you? Yeah, need to hold off. Like for for legitimately the lives of some people that because and I keep saying this: the stretching to grow and the stretching to breaking point. Yeah, and this, I fear, will be the latter, but hopefully I'm wrong. Um, so, in amongst your interesting career, sort of, you know, starting in corporate land, um, you know, going through ad- advice land, power planning, a little bit of um, advice, uh, kicking off an ETF company, mm-hmm. you've got some UX skills up your sleeve. Something that's really interesting in your career is you are working on a superannuation fund. Yeah. Now, this is a world that I, I'm really passionate about, obviously, because I was an advisor, I had my own company, and then got pretty close to launching a superannuation uh, fund myself. And the reason why I did it is because the importance of that chunk of money is of utmost importance, right? Like... Even though you can't spend it for a long time, when you need it, it's excessively important. Um, but because of the time to expenditure, no one cares about it. And so, the only solution that you can achieve uh, to get people to care about it is emotionally engaging them in their uh, investments rather than just telling them that there's lost super. Yeah. Um, and so the, one of the many benefits that, um, advisors provide is they, they, they give a human face to their superannuation. So if you're my advisor, I go, Steve, how's it going, mate? And you go, good. This is what's happening in your super and explain it to me and show me and give me modeling. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, all that's happening is I get a, a letter in the mail once a year with a colorful pie graph. I don't know anything about it. I disdain it. I say at, at, at its worst, it's an extra tax, you yeah. know, at best, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so that's the current environment. The apathy and disdain is far higher or, 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 or exceptionally above the importance of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Um, I wasn't able to succeed because, uh, superannuation is very difficult. Um, and you, for better or for worse, <laughs> have ended up uh, in on the same path. And I, I mean, I'm looking at your, your drink bottle right here and it says tomorrow. So, tomorrow super, you're a part of this team. Um, talk to us about what it is that you want to help people achieve. Yeah, so um, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it's the most yeah. important one. Um, one of our like our key sort of mottos is giving people more transparency, choice, and control. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we think um, in the super space, um, that's something that probably a lot of funds haven't provided. Um, whether it's the transparency of what you're invested in, um, the choice of what you can invest in, or the control of of how you're going to invest it, um, and clearly financial advisors do a lot of that work for their clients and they use um, platforms that that support that Mm. and so we've gone into tomorrow with a sort of financial planning mindset where um you know we want transparency so we're looking at using managed accounts so that um our our, um, clients can see what they're invested in um our you know building portfolios that are risk profile based so you know a lot of the new super funds kind of give you two options um if you're lucky yeah. um whereas you know we've come out of the world of financial planning and you know the different risk tolerances and everything and so you know risk profiles and then also the tools to to allow people to work out their risk tolerance and sort of track it over time and then you know and then there's just a whole bunch of um things that um you know insurance it's obviously a really important part but um, probably neglected by a lot of the direct-to-consumer offers. Either they don't offer insurance or it's 
you know, you got 50 grand in a default insurance option and that's it. Mm. Um, so give, allowing people to, um, you know, work out how much insurance they need and, um, and, and offer that within the solution. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the path we're on. Um, can't it's been, it's been a long journey, right? Yeah, it has been. I mean, from from the time that I was trying to set up my super fund, you guys have been around. Yeah, yeah. So I've I'm, only I'm been like three or four years. Yeah, I've only been part of the company for a few months. But um, but Wes, um, our CEO, he's been going for a while. Yeah. Um, with a few pivots along the way, um, <laughs> we're getting getting much closer to launching now. Um, and like one of our things is also, you know, we're not. We've, we've come out of the world of financial advice. We understand the value that financial advisors give and we're not looking at taking that away. And so we're going to be, we're going to have a direct offer, mm-hmm. have a great user experience. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, getting, you know, there's like, like with most super funds, you still got paper forms to fill out to do simple stuff. And it's like, yeah, man, like it's 2020. Yeah. It's, uh, it's painful. Um, uh, my uh, wife, uh, you know, because we're, we're pregnant with our first child and she sort of said, okay, well, I want to I want to look at my insurances. I want to look at my super and I want to look at it all. I said, okay, cool. Well, yeah. you know, like I'm pretty experienced in this sort of stuff. So we had a look at all of our super funds. We found uh, the one with the most insurance. Um, but it still took us about two months yeah. to get everything to the point where it was finished. Yeah. But in two months, yeah. and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's painful. And yeah. um, and uh, and I mean, we've got we've got SuperStream two that's existed for many years. Like we like the government actually has built the back office for the super funds to to be far more efficient. But there's too much uh, money in uh in not educating. Yeah, the client. There's too much yeah. money attached to um, making people seem like it's difficult. That the industry has been built on how do we make this more difficult? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's a challenge. I know, for example, if you look at, I guess, the big three new super funds that came out over the last few years, you had Future, which. Yep. No one really spoke too much about, but they had a really good launch strategy. They identified their target market really well, um, and they just went after them. Yeah, which was essentially um, left politics. Yeah, like if you believe in left politics, you believe in this super fund. And then you had Spaceship Super, which was far more mass media. I've never met the girl that did the the growth hack for that launch. To my mind, it's the greatest. Uh, growth hack launch in Australian history to get people to care about super yep. was phenomenal. Now, of course, if if you sort of tracked the success of Spaceship over the last few years, they did remarkably well upon launch and have kind of not quite lived up to the expectations. No. And because, and that's the difference between having a growth hack. And having uh, a consistent message yep. that backs up that yeah, growth yeah. hack, right? Um, not not to fault what they did. Uh, to be very clear, they nailed it, yeah. right? They did extremely, yeah. extremely well. Um, and then you've got uh, Grow Super, who they gave multiple options. I really liked the premise of this product. It was like... Do you believe in ethical? Do you believe yeah. in green? Do you believe in tech? Do you believe in, you know, what, what, what is the thing that you want to be invested in? Here's your tilt. And then how much between zero and 15% do you, do you like really believe yeah, in it? Yeah. Man, like the, the premise for that product was really cool. Done by a really young team, you know, killer team. Again, uh, did quite well on launch and then, uh, such is life, superannuation being what it is. People don't care too much yep. about it. Acquisition cost is, you know, around that $400 mark. The fighting lethargicness, is that a word? Anyway, fighting apathy. Yeah. And um, and in the end have become uh, sort of a, a, back, uh, a back office to IWF. Um, and they're succeeding quite well there now as far as I can tell. And the big news... The big, big, big news is Sargon. Yeah. 
that's that blows those three uh, that's interesting out of yeah. the water. And so out of those three super funds, um, Future Super has done relatively well. Uh, Spaceship and Grow have struggled despite how well I thought they did on yeah. launch and and their product, the the premise of their product. And then you've got Sargon, which raised what a hundred million dollars, I think it was. Huge, yeah. just huge amounts of money. I know Peter Thiel was involved there. I think he got out quite quickly though. Um, and they, they've they just gone into, now I've got to be clear with my words, administration, here, administration. Yeah. administration, not liquidation, yeah. um, which and means so they essentially they have volunteered, um, right? Yeah. And so yeah. they have diverse uh, as a trustee in well, their stable. And trustee partners. So yeah. they own two yeah. trustees. Who... Are the what? trustee for most of these super funds. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, between trustee partners and OneView, that's got ninety uh, percent of the of yeah. the new super fund market for yeah. sure. Now it's got it's it's a diverser was sold by OneView. I wonder if a I wonder if OneView get the money. I guess out of all of the companies, they're probably the the most concerned. But what's what's interesting to me, and, and my point around all this is. Um, Financial services is really difficult to launch and succeed in. So, with tomorrow coming on board, do you guys expect to be able to um, service consumers and advisors? Like, will you ultimately be a new challenger to the what I mentioned before was NetWealth and Hub24 are doing really well? Do, do you expect to try to take that on or do you expect to try and take, you know, on where sort of spaceship and... Yeah, um, it's a good question and still working through that. Totally. Um, but but I think what, what, because we have this financial advice background and we believe in advice, Yes. We, but we also believe in great user experience and yeah. um, great client outcomes, we think we can, you know, we, we, we're going for the direct market. Yep. But we also think we can build a product that we can work with advisors on. Now... Will we ever try to be as fully featured as Hub and NetWealth with five thousand managed funds and yeah, yeah. Um, all of that sort of cap and and all the other capability that they have? Um, no, we're not we're not looking at sort of directly competing. But for the advisor who has a client who you know they they want they they believe in managed portfolios and they believe in our managed portfolios and they're looking for a low cost solution with a great user experience like we might be the option that that they can use for them cool or you know you know these days it's, there's more and more clients that um advisors are switching off their ongoing advice because they're saying well, it's not commercial to service you anymore um yeah uh and you know but then what do you do with portfolio management for those clients? Um, this might be a solution for those sort of clients where it's like, you know, this, these guys will help you out but and you can tap into advice when you need it with me. Yeah, um, okay. So, I think there's that's where I think there's an opportunity. Yep. Um, and hopefully we can get there. Man, I'll take my hat off to you if you can get there. Um, yeah, look, it's, uh, it's a really hard road. Yeah. I, I pursued it for 18 months full time and the amount of respect I have um, actually, there's another one, Grant Britz. He did uh, Super Estate, uh, yeah. which which he he he's like consistently growing, um, and he knows exactly who his market is. He he's going after um, Qu- Queenslanders who love property. Like he's yeah. like these are the these are my people, and this is the asset yeah. class that they like. And he just he understands his market really well, and uh, he's actually sort of the dark horse. He's just plugging away. He was the one of the last ones out of that sort of cohort of new super funds yep. that came out and he's just, he's building it, you know, and I, I catch up with him every now and again. He's a really good guy. He's a former Olympian and he doesn't like to sort of talk about it, but he, he's won medals in the Olympics and wow. stuff like that. Yeah. He's a, he's a good guy. And, um, yeah, I wish, I wish him all the luck as I do you, mate. So good. I just have infinite respect to anyone that's able to do it. Because it's a tough space. You know, it's, it is a just, really, 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 really tough yeah, space. There's a lot working against you. Like the compliance and the that, that sort of thing alone. Is the whole to industry kinda... loves dragging things into mud so that they don't move and then yeah. enjoys watching the young entrepreneur squirm and yeah. goes, Oh, yeah. didn't expect this, did you, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, you know, and nothing's easy, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> Nothing's easy. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a really good point, man. Yeah. Um, look, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story, what you've been up to, and uh, what you, you what you're getting done these days. Uh, if if there's advisors out there that are interested in reaching out, you know, like hit us. What's your websites? What's your LinkedIn? Yeah. So um, etfwatch.com.au. Um, sign up to the mailing list. We send a um, monthly email with an update on what's happening in the market. Um, also, always looking for guest contributors. If you're an advisor who has an opinion on um, some of the things that we talked about or just the market in general or portfolio management, i um, love to have someone else writing my content. <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly would, um, you know, you know, put links back to your website and all those sorts of things. That's so, pretty good. Um, yeah, getting get in contact if you're interested. And then, yeah, if you're interested in following Tomorrow Super, um, tomorrowsuper.com.au, you can sign up to our mailing list there and um, we'll be in contact when we kind of get launched. Very good. And, yeah. and people can find you on the XY platform as well. I'm on the XY platform, yeah. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Yes. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.